thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, we have um, an excellent group of um, speakers today who are going to speak about the work of the standards that each of them are in a leadership role on. And this stems from the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. And out of that um, uh, program, we've um, a document entitled Ethically Aligned Design, which is at version two now, which was uh, worked on by hundreds of people throughout the world. And one of the um, uh, outcomes of this document, uh, as this document was being worked on, has led to um, the standard projects that David was, was mentioning. And <clears throat> so I don't want to detract from the excellent lineup of speakers we have. So. Uh, we're going to go in the order of the numbers of the standards. So we're going to start with um, P7003 and Andor uh, begin his presentation. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I'm not sure Ansgar is uh, is with us. So if it's okay with uh, Marcelli, Marcelli, can we go ahead and uh, and kick it over to you so you can start your slides? Yes, absolutely. And we'll add Ansgar. And for those of you who are listening in, what Ansgar presents is the reality that um, with all types of computing, the people who create code also have some inherent biases. And how can we look at that situation of bias and be putting in some ethical considerations so we don't just roll with the flow and then be surprised with outcomes? Like, how do we meaningfully create the outcomes we want? So then my, my specific focus is thinking about the next generation. And this is our first generation to be connected digitally, literally before birth, so from the womb and past the tomb. And what are the implications for our children growing up in a completely digitized environment? Now, I know not everyone on the world is already connected to the Internet. And we're coming pretty close to half of the world. And so as we look at this milestone mark, it's a good time for us to look at, are, are we having the internet experience that we want? What does it look like going forward? And how can we help create a really healthy, positive environment, a digital environment for our children? And I love this picture of the grandma and the grandson because you see so much that's organic and natural and you see time passing and, and you see the hope in their eyes with this little boy with his laptop and you can see the trust the grandma has that She's excited for her grandson and also the amount of um, they're fragile. And, and how can we help them get onto the web and, and participate in a way that is ethical and meaningful and provides for them what we really want, our goals for them as society, which is to be able to communicate and collaborate and to be able to improve and have the opportunity to grow. So next slide. So what we have to really recognize when it comes to children and students when they get online, regardless if they get online at home or at school, is that they don't have a choice. And with a digital environment, there's no big giant eraser button. Oh, in the old days, we used to say, oh, it could go on your permanent record and or it's going to go on your transcript. And that was in essence of saying etched in stone. Now, <laughs> this is going to follow you around. And it created this sense of um, permanency and also some anxiety. And now with everything digitized so much, it creates a digital footprint of a child's experience as they experience and also a footprint of what others think of or post about or um, their interactions with this child. And when it comes to students, regardless of how old we are, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice about the school's data practices and we don't have a school a choice about the vendors and their data practices. And, and uh, currently, that's just where it is. There, there's not a plan B for that one. And then the reality is that da the data collected about our children and about adult students, it impacts their academic and their e employment opportunities and, and their economic opportunities. And moving forward, it can even impact their personal relationships. And we see this quite a bit with some of the trauma and drama that goes online, but also from some of the permanence when you know all the nitty gritties about a breakup or not a breakup. And in some cultures, the images that can be posted can significantly impact particularly a woman's, a young woman's life 
uh, and there's not a resolution for that right now for them. So just to review, right now at this moment, we don't have a choice about the schools and, and their practices or their vendors or the third parties of those vendors. And the outcome is potentially lifelong for good or for ill. Next slide. So what do we really need to know about our children and our students' data? So if we have a snapshot of this is where we are, then the next slide, I want to walk through these three critical components. First of all, we go to the web and we use technology for a reason. We either want to find something or we want to do something. And we go there, and as we are looking for or we log in, we are served content. And it's important that we consider the difference between the word search and serve. And we'll talk more about it, but the concept of served means someone else has selected what you will see, or if someone serves you dinner and they didn't ask you, they'll, they'll serve you what they want you to eat, but nece not necessarily what you wanted. And in the web situation, we are actually served. And although we have the search button or the search key, or we have the search icon, we're actually served, and we're served by algorithms, and those algorithms are created for specific reasons and for, or for certain companies or specific market reasons or political reasons, and we don't know what they are. We just know we're served information. And what we see then becomes a social norm, and it, it affects and impacts our children and our students' beliefs about the world around them. So what our children, our students do online what they find through their own search and through the serving what that happens. It impacts what they believe is going on in the world. It shapes their social norms and it absolutely impacts their own personal paradigms, which in turn shapes what they do. So what we believe or what our children believe then shapes their actions. And those actions shape the opportunities and those actions also shape in a circle what we find online, which shapes what we believe, which shapes what we do. So I just want you to have this in your mind, this circle of, as humans, we did not evolve with, skin, with uh, the screens. So our bodies, we evolved to use our senses, to look around, to see what's happening side to side, what are other people doing. But on the web, there, the social norms are set by all the cues around the information. It can be the fonts and the colors and how the information is displayed. Okay, next slide. So I think, um, I wish the internet were like a big library and there was just so much information that we could peruse at our own leisure and, and, and space and place. I love this library. I, I took my kids here once and you just walk in and you feel this immense amount of history recorded. You have a context for the the culture, the country that gathered it. You have the architecture that helps set some of the context for that culture. You've got the statues of the people they value. So you walk into this library and you understand the bias of the people who created it. So of course we don't know the meaning of every book and we don't have a complete knowledge of, I, no one has a complete knowledge of all of that information. But everyone in the library on that main floor can look and see all the same things and we have a shared experience with that information. Okay, go to the next slide. So there's so many books, you can't really look at them all in one spot because you'd have to walk them and down the stairs. So there's these beautiful card catalogs and go to the next one. And sometimes you have rows and rows of card catalogs, but still, even still, there is a paper catalog and you know you could potentially open every drawer and touch every piece of paper and every single person in this library, in this, this is the law library, every card catalog could be experienced by every person regardless of their race or their ethnic background or their uh, political slant. Everybody would have access to all of those same cards. Okay, next slide. So the internet's so big, it's not a library and we don't find things by card catalogs. We can put in search terms and we can tag things and we can hope for the best, but it's all done by algorithms and it's math and people trying to guess what we'll find, what we will find personally interesting. And also what will keep us on a platform, a specific platform. 
And when you look at the amount of um, resources that have been created and used also in the technology space, a huge percentage of it is the free experience, so we call it free from the consumer end, that then is funded by the commercial side of getting information to us that we will find interesting and stay on a platform, and also something that we'll find interesting enough to purchase or interesting enough to change a, a position, a belief, or a, a paradigm. So there's an enormous amount of resources, financial resources, that go into getting information to people that they think will be most likely to interest them and have them pause, stay on a platform, and or purchase or adopt a new philosophy or paradigm. And this is all done by algorithms. And they're not the same for anyone. Not one person has all the same algorithms. Okay, next page. So I love this. I lived in a small area for a while, a small university farming town, and we had a bookmobile. And if you have ever lived in an area where all you have is a bookmobile, you just literally, you just pray that somebody's going to put as many books that are interesting in that bookmobile when it comes around to your place because it's so small. And uh, what we have in our screens is essentially a bookmobile. And it is filled by people or companies or organizations that have, uh, that are part of this ecosystem that bring us information that shape our experiences and what we do online. So instead of having our librarians that then, we, because we can't go up and down all those card catalogs, we can't look at every book, mathematical formulas who know where we live with our IP address or where our IP address is, which is going to get you very close to where you are. And I know if I look at my IP address, it gets me within less than 100 feet. And that also says so much about my political slant or my economic impact. If I were to, my purchase power, it gives you an idea of my race, my religion, because people tend to live together with other people that are really quite similar. So by knowing my IP address alone, there's so much information that is known about me. And this also includes my unique identifier, my device identifier, and the speed of my network, and the speed of my device. All of these say an enormous amount about me. And then you add on top of that my language, and the fonts I use, and the plugins on my browser, which browser I use, all of these, when I do a little quick footprint, there's not another computer just like mine. If, if I don't do anything on it except open it up, there's one within 500,000 computers that are like mine have uh, similarities. So it gets, it's pretty easy in the technology world to be able to identify people and their interests and where they live and the probabilities of what things are important to them. So next. So this brings us back to our, our little circle. Uh, when, as human beings, one of the most motivating, really, it is the most motivating factor for change, is to be aligning with those with us side by side. We want to stay in the middle of the pack. Um, and that happened probably, uh, if, if you look at evolution as, as the model, the, the very one, the first person and the last person, they got picked off. It's the ones that stay in the middle. They're the ones, you know, you look, well, are my neighbors using seatbelts or are my neighbors using helmets, uh, what, what, what are we feeding kids now, what, what, what do we do? We look from side to side and say, what's happening, what's normal? And these social norms are the most motivating in, in creating change. And when you look at a device, we could take the exact same device. So let's say we all have a um, MacBook Pro, or we could say it's a Chromebook. Either way, we just take the exact same device and let's put it in 20 different parts of the world on 20 different networks and ask for a search term. And even if we haven't searched prior on these devices, because the IP address says so much about who we are, where we are, says so much about our income and our purchase power, then that the information that comes, how it's packaged, and the ads that frame it shape the social norms of the viewer, which means our children in the areas that have the least financial resources are also most likely to not get information 
they could be excluded for a lot of reasons. And they are the ones, so I live in Palo Alto, right next to Stanford, I'm a block from Stanford, and the ads that shape the content that come to my children are going to be remodel your home or refinance, go on a vacation, buy a fancy camera, a ma uh, maybe a new, a new lens for it, um, a Tesla. These are all commonplace in the neighborhood, so they're commonplace on the ads. And just less than, I can ride my bike and be there in 15 minutes, in East Palo Alto, where there's so much disparity in healthcare, in access to uh, resources, those children are going to see ads for fast food, uh, for self-defense, for maybe weapons, or um, they're not going to have the same, it's social norms, this experience for them. And even though we live so close, the shared paradigms are town squares where we all experience something together, we have less of those because even with similar devices, what we see and how we see it is so contextual, it is very different. And it becomes more and more different as our society becomes more and more granularly fed and served content by the algorithms that have identified what will most likely meet others' goals will most likely keep us on a platform, most likely have us purchase something. And this process of what we find when we search and, you know, quotations, what we do, it shapes our belief of what the norms are and what's possible. And that in, t in turn shapes what we do, which in turn shapes what we find, we believe and do. And all of this, yeah, I'm not even talking about the personal things that we write about ourselves. So when it comes to children and students, that's another conversation that all fits on top. But I want for you through the IEEE lens, through the engineering perspective and the real building blocks of the technology experience, at the IP address, so much is decided by the speed and the quality of the network and so much about the device itself with the unique identifier that's the type of content and the type of experience. So the next slide. In, in concluding, with the P7004, our goal is to look at children and students and see them through the realistic lens that they don't control their data and they don't control the outcomes and others at school and at home are creating a digital reputation and footprint and a uh, profile that could potentially impact them lifelong, and it can it could be lifelong benefit. It could be a lifelong gain. It can also be a lifelong shackle, depending on many things. And a great deal of those many things are on our shoulders and our responsibility to improve the transparency so we know what happens to their data. We have choices, and that hopefully they can participate in those choices as they become more mature and that there's a better sense of accountability because this is our next generation and we will live with the consequences of if we are awake at the wheel with technology, we can have the technology we want if we see the impact and understand that we don't have a library. We, it is not impartial. Technology is, is biased just by default and it can become a bias that we can productively manage or we can passively allow things to happen and lose this moment in history where we can have the internet and the communities that we want. So the last slide is the contact information. If you're interested in this area, we would love to have you participate in 7004. Um, the area of student data is completely uncharted. There's so few protections and a lot of, uh, a lot of dialogue in the area of student data governance. So we just absolutely welcome you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I know I personally have so many questions I'd like to ask you right now, but um, unfortunately in the, uh, in the interests of time, um, we're gonna move on to ELF now. Um, in about the P7000, fine. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. I've had some problems. Uh, I, I guess I get the chat 
not work. The P7005 for standard for transparent employer data gap, the uh, um, transparent world. Um, you should have a right, the ability to know and to edit and to delete data that your employer has on. Uh, so uh, that there are no surprises bring up on you almost. If we take next slide, please. Let me read. Please. Yes. We want to set up here. Construct a set of peer guidelines for the employer a certain storing pick. And we have been um, discussing uh, this pick quite a lot. Hi, Ulf. This is David. Can you hear me? Yep. Your audio is, is quite low. If we can just have you either speak up or uh, increase your volume, uh, we have some trouble hearing you on our end. Just wanted to, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. Uh, is it better now? That's much better. Thank you. Good. So, um, um, what I say is, this is what we started with a year ago. We will probably modify this text. It's taken from a bar. Just as next slide. The scope. Uh, we want to define specific methodologies or processes to help employers to certify how they approach accessing, collecting, storing, utilizing, sharing, and destroying employee data. Uh, that's an important part. Uh, I'm not quite... Uh, yeah, this text will also be changed, so don't take the second uh, sentence too serious. But next slide. Why is this standard needed? Well, um, we heard Masali, and we will hear uh, Anska speaking about uh, algorithms and uh, the significance of, of uh, data. Y your digital footprint is uh, much larger than most people uh, understand or believe. And uh, uh, of course, lots of companies are using this uh, available data in assessing uh, possible uh, hires and listings and also the staff that they have. Um, in more than 100 countries this, uh, today, uh, there are regulations on data protection, privacy, but uh, they generally not, do not cover this specific situation that you have in the employer-employee relation. Actually, I don't know if there is anyone else than the PR that has a little bit of this. Most of them is uh, more like a, a customer relation than an employer-employee relation. And this, of course, gives problems. Um, you have quite a huge imbalance of power between uh, yourself and your employer. And uh, that means that, uh, for instance, consent, which is uh, the normal thing uh, that is uh, in, in the regulation for um, uh, for uh, being allowed to store, collect, and store data, cannot be the only uh, parameter in the employer-employee relation. Really, have to be some legal, some necessity. Uh, to justify the collection of data. Hi, Ulf. Uh, sorry to interrupt again. This is David from IEEE. Uh, we, we are having some real challenges with your audio. If, you could, if there's anything else you could do on your end to just ramp up the volume a little bit, um, I would really appreciate it. Does it work better now? Yeah, there's uh, a little bit of a buzzing noise in the background, but it is yeah. louder. Okay. Uh, You'll have to uh, uh, to um, take the bus. On, I'm sorry, because uh, the other mic doesn't work. Obviously, it's the computer fan probably that's buzzing. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, you well, also, thank you. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Okay. You also, as an uh, employee, must have a right to a private life. I'm working for a company uh, that's, at least the mother company, Sony, is uh, very well known, but uh, my, uh, my part of it is Sony Mobile Communications AB. We are making uh, what, uh, they, what uh, Scott Adams and Dilbert call personal locator devices, also known as smartphones. And with the technical possibilities you have today, you can be monitored on uh, where, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, and that's not really what we want to have. And we have to, to uh, come to rights with it. And uh, there also is uh, the use of algorithms in the recruitment process and in, in the entire HR field. Those of us or, uh, who are uh, software engineers uh, know very well that uh, computers, at least at this stage, is pretty good at what they are supposed to do. But whenever there is some unexpected situation, they are not quite that good, and the errors do occur. Re uh, recently, we had here in Sweden um, a leakage of information from the tax authorities for 130,000 people, and it was through that bank that this leak was just the day before yesterday. And the security, of course, of data is also very important. Next slide, please. So why do employers need PEA 7005? Well, uh, a lot of uh, the professionals today uh, have very specific competence that is scarce. And uh, to, to have a good reputation as a company is, of course, uh, important, very important to get the top talent. But you also uh, need the standard to get a unified and transparent global process for maintaining and uh, collecting and deleting employee data uh, that will uh, facilitate the administration of your employees and your employee data. And also the small companies that doesn't have the resources, small and medium and sized uh, enterprises, will have a help to navigate uh, the best practices of data handling. And of course, there is uh, a pecuniary uh, imperative as well. Uh, for instance, uh, in Europe, in the EU, the GDPR that uh, was uh, enforced in May this year has fines for up to 4% of yearly turnover or 20 million euro, whichever is highest, if you abuse the, the legislation. And that is not only for companies based in the EU, but for companies doing business in or with EU. Um, okay, next slide, please. Right. Uh, very shortly, we have about 30 people working in this project, and um, uh, the plan is that we should be ready for the initial ballot in the second quarter 2019. I think I'll call, uh, keep this short because um, we are, uh, there are two more speakers and I know they have long presentations. So next slide, please. Yeah, the project officials, you can read for yourself. Unfortunately, the contact information is not here but it is available from IEEE ESA and it's on the, in the wiki for the P7005 project. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, presentation. Um, I just, just one very, very quick question. Um, will this um, be utilized to apply to applicants data, not just employees? Yes. Uh, I mean, it, it, when I'm using the word employee, it shouldn't be uh, just those that have an um, employment contract with, uh, with the employer, but uh, everyone who is doing services for the employer or is applying to, 
to do services. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, with that, we're going to move on to Ansgar, talking about P7003. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, so P7003 is the standard for algorithmic bias considerations. Um, if we'll just move to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so what do we mean with algorithmic bias? So in, in a certain sense, you could say any algorithm that does more than just give you a random response is hopefully biased towards giving you a response that matches what um, you were asking for. So. What we're talking about in algorithmic bias considerations is that we're trying to minimize bias that is unintended or unjustified or un unacceptable within the context where the system is being used. So if we go to the next slide. So a couple of examples of cases that have been reported where this kind of uh, algorithmic bias has become apparent are things like algorithmic discrimination, such as the example of um, image face recognition algorithms that um, Joy uh, Bulwini has highlighted were not able to recognize her face because uh, she's black and uh, the algorithms were trained on data sets that were primarily white and also primarily male faces. So a lot of uh, face recognition and face analysis algorithms actually work best only for um, white faces. Uh, so this is a clear case of um, algorithmic bias that is unintended, um, but has potentially large consequences uh, um, concerning the way in which uh, people end up interacting with these kinds of systems. So the next one um, was an interesting example of a, shall we say, misguided attempt to try and think that simply because an algorithm is at its base, its, um, its code, its based on logic um, and, and mathematics, that simply because you're using the algorithm, you might end up getting rid of potential sources of bias. Uh, they thought that if they'd apply AI to doing a beauty contest, somehow this, in its base, a very ob subjective kind of thing would end up being unbiased. And probably to nobody's surprise in, in hindsight, uh, that is not what they found. Actually, this AI system ended up being heavily biased with a vast majority of highly ranked so-called beautiful people all having light skin. Um, again, this is, could be traced back to the data sets that were being used, but also to the way in which uh, actually the whole task was being conceived, so highlighting that there's also a question about how the system is being set up in the first place that can introduce bias. The next example I wanted to briefly mention is a case where there was an intention to use uh, algorithms to analyze people's uh, social media activities and somehow use this um, to then give uh, young new drivers uh, reduced insurance premiums. So the idea here was really uh, we don't have a lot of past experience about whether a person is a reckless driver because they, they're a new driver, but if we can look at whether they're reckless um, social media users, we'll infer that they're also not trustworthy drivers. This, however, introduces a different kind of bias, which is if you are not a social media user or not a user of that particular social media, you would not qualify for the reduction in insurance premium. So there's a bias to a particular set of people who happen to be able to produce the data that the system is being used is using. So in the uh, bottom left, I'm trying to sort of just summarize a, a, a kind of bias that has been frequently sh uh, showing up, which is effectively historical bias. So this uh, little illustration shows that the white male um, is getting the tick mark, is basically being preferentially treated simply because historically they've been preferentially treated. So if you were to look into historical data, for instance, employment records, you will find that um, if you just train your AI system to decide who should get the job based on who got the jobs in the past, you will primarily hire white men. 
Um, so this is a problem in uh, algorithmic systems. If you simply take the data sets that are most easy to get at, you can easily build in bias that you did not intend, and that certainly was not justified. And, and the last one is an example that has been drawing a lot of attention, which is around the use of algorithmic systems in the criminal justice system. Um, where investigation by journalists has shown that there is a bias in the system. Um, but in this case, there is uh, more to the problem of bias, which is something that I'll be getting back, uh, um, getting into in more detail uh, in a couple of slides' time. And next slide, please. Uh, so this is just to highlight uh, one major area where bias can uh, come into algorithmic systems, and this is really sort of at the conceptual stage. So the example that I'm showing here was the case of uh, some researchers who came up with the idea of using an AI system to look at uh, faces and try and see whether they could identify whether a person is um, heterosexual or homosexual. Um, and then the AI system was being trained on that, and they they claimed that it would be better at identifying people's uh, sexual orientation than a human could. Um, however, if you actually step back and think about it a bit more, you can see that there is a bias being built into the system from the very start, namely the idea that sexuality is binary. Um, lots of research in social science has shown that it's probably more likely best described as being on, on a continuum. Some people are more um, uh, extremely just just the one or the other, and other people fall in the middle. But because the algorithm starts off with a categorization of there being only two categories, it builds in a kind of bias of, of, of a binary society. Uh, so this is an issue that needs to be considered. What kind of categories are being thought about at the very start when the system is being set up? Um, to the next slide, please. So this is picking up on the uh, case of uh, the use of algorithms in the criminal justice system. So the situation was a algorithm uh, for trying to predict whether a person is likely to reoffend if they are um, let out on parole um, or uh, yeah. Um, so the, system, the people who developed the system, which is, um, uh, they said they made sure that it wasn't biased because the accuracy of the system, the rate at which it made correct predictions, um, was the same for both white and black defendants, which is indicated in the blue box. Um, the journalists, however, did an analysis of the kinds of um, in, uh, kinds of errors that the system was making and showed that there was actually a strong um, bias in the algorithm's behavior in that when an error was being made for black defendants, it would tend to judge them as being uh, as more severe than they really were and their criminal tendencies, whereas for white defendants, it would judge them as less severe. So um, the false positive and false negative rate shown in the green box uh, did show clear uh, discriminatory behavior. Now, what this highlights is a fundamental problem with algorithmic decision making, well, with any decision making really, but with the concept that by introducing an algorithmic system, you could make um, bias disappear, which is that uh, it is actually impossible to make, to just, to, to be unbiased across all different criteria of bias. So this is a socio-technical problem, a question of which kind of bias do we consider to be more important. And this is a kind of problem that you will see in more and more kind of applications of algorithmic systems, um, which links to some of the issues that we uh, highlight in the um, algorithmic bias consideration standard. Uh, next slide, please. So some, the key questions really that we ask um, users of the standard to consider and that the standard helps them to um, to clarify are, first of all, be clear when you're building an algorithmic system that you understand who will be affected by it. Um, 
have a clear understanding of what the decision or optimization criteria actually are that drive the kinds of decisions that the system is producing. And then knowing the criteria that are being used, be clear what your justifications are for these criteria. So clarify them. So this is particularly an issue, for instance, with machine learning uh, systems where the system is being built based on example uh, data sets that it can become uh, blurred to understand what the actual criteria is that you're using and therefore the kind what your actual justification should be for using this criteria. So we're saying this is uh, not an acceptable situation. You need to be clear about what the criteria are and clear about your justifications. And as a final step, it's important that these the justifications that you have for using these criteria must be acceptable within the context where they're being used. And often the best way to make sure that this is the case is to actually be public about this and get feedback from the affected community to understand whether the um, decision criteria and the justifications, therefore, will be accepted by them. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, um, the standard is currently a about one and a half years in development. We're probably somewhere around the halfway point. Um, and this slide just uh, shows some of the core sections that uh, you would find in the uh, standards document that's currently being developed. So the top part being foundational sections that highlight uh, sort of core baseline issues and the bottom groups being um, more technical issues that would highlight um, methodologies and process for going through and evaluating the system. And I won't uh, read through all of them right now. Um, next slide, please. So why should anybody consider using B7003? Well, effectively, if you're a business um, that is using or plans to use automated decisions or support systems as part of the process that affects customer experiences, then personal, such things such as personalization or individual assessment any such system that produces different results for some people than for the other people um, can be challenged as being biased. So any system that performs filtering or prioritization functions will fall into this. Under these cases, if there's a possibility that you could become, be challenged, that your system is biased, it is necessary for you to be able to give a clear response, indicate what kind of uh, steps were taken to uh, mitigate any unintended or unjustified um, bias that might arise. And so in order to do this, to help um, guide through that process, that's really what uh, P7003 is trying to do. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's it really. And here's the link to the site where uh, you will find further information and the minutes um, and agenda of, of the meetings that we're having. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, uh, very fascinating and informative. <coughs> and excuse me. now we are moving to Katrina. Are you there and can you hear us? Hello, Katrina. Okay, well, apparently Katrina's having uh, difficulties with her audio, but um, fortunately um, we have um, John Haven on the line and he um, uh, will uh, can speak to the uh, P7006. Hey, Justin, can you hear me okay? Yep, we got you, John. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, well, I will try to do even one-seventh as great a job as the amazing Katrina Dow, and hopefully uh, maybe Katrina will be able to um, uh, come in because uh, 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 as chair of the group, she certainly will do a great job. Also, quick question, um, Justin or Davey, can you let me know? I think I have about 10 minutes. I just want to make sure I don't speak for too long. If you yeah, can just uh, shoot me an IM. Sure, about 10 minutes. Is that right? About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, um, for a history of P7006 uh, in terms of a personal data AI agent, I've been honored to work with uh, Katrina Dow 
for the past few years, she and I are actually um, chairs of, uh, a, uh, of a committee that is part of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. Um, that committee is uh, called Personal Data uh, 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 Access Control, and uh, actually this um, inspiration for this uh, standard working group, P7006, came as a part of this committee. Uh, there were a number of people on the committee that um, felt that uh, it was imperative to start actively creating this idea of an artificial intelligence agent that could represent essentially a person's terms and conditions and act as their doppelganger or their agent in the same way that a legal agent acts with regards to your data. Um, and it was really critical to, to you know, submit this as a standards, uh, a potential standard idea. So we were honored that uh, the IEEE Standards Association felt it was worthy to become a uh, working group. And with Katrina Dow as chair and the amazing Gree Hasselbach as vice chair, um, the group has been, uh, from my impression, just been doing fantastic work uh, for the last year or so. If you can go to the next slide, and again, um, I'll do my best to honor Katrina's work. And um, uh, to start off with the goal for this standard is to educate on why it's in the best interest for society to create the mechanisms for individuals to train these personal AI agents that move beyond asymmetry to harmonize data usage for the future. Uh, one thing, knowing how really complex aspects of personal data management are and that globally uh, terms like privacy uh, can be very uh, interpreted in different ways. In general, the basic idea of something like, say, the GDPR, which is the uh, General Protection Data Regulate, the legislation that has recently come out of the European Union, which is focused on having organizations protect individuals' data. Granted, it is uh, focused mainly on European citizens, but the point is it's an amazing landmark um, piece of legislation that really is helping organizations um, understand and be more responsible to, in a, in a great way, how to handle uh, individuals' data. That said, the logic of this group, and can you go to the next slide? Um, the group was created because uh, uh, there is this opportunity now with this brave different world to create new societal value and a cornerstone of the idea of this group is that it's, it's imperative, of course, for governments, organizations to protect and take care of and steward uh, people's uh, data, like Marsley was talking about before with kids and Booth was talking about with employees, uh, really important. Um, and let me just do this. I'm gonna pause for a second because it looks like we might have Katrina back and I will defer to the expert if she's there. Katrina, are you on the line? John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And again, yes. I'm going to let you right. talk now because you, you're the expert. Okay, go for it. Take over. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Um, a huge apologies, everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll pick this up and thank you, John. Uh, you did a, uh, a great start. So um, I think uh, David's going to hand the ball over so I can um, so that I can just whiz you through the slides. So one of the things that uh, came out of the work that John uh, wanted to in really encouraged us with P7006 was to say, could we focus on what some of the positive aspects of this work might be? Um, and I think what uh, Masali and um, Ansgar um, has done, have done really well so far is point out some of the things that we really need to be ethically and architecturally aware of and some of the concerns that we really need to be designing for. And what we were hoping to try and do with P7006 is say, if this is the world that we're moving towards and if algorithms or artificial intelligence or, or assisted decisions are gonna be part of the world, could we, could we look at how new societal value could be created? And most importantly, this charter of us having the promise of elevating humankind. So a lot of the work that we're doing on P7006 is really focused on how we can create a balance around um, being able to embrace these new technologies, but at the same time elevate our humanity. 
So one of the things that I think has been really addressed very well in the previous presentations is that currently technology, AI, robotics, they're moving at such an exponential pace and coding some of these new social norms and coding bias or using uh, data sets that haven't been considered from an ethical or an architectural point of view that were already the genies out of the bag. So a lot of the problems that we're starting to see arise in society are as a result of our early attempts to start to create, train, and develop either AI or algorithms. Um, and one of the things that we noticed that is the greatest challenge right now, and, and this I think Masali did a great job of in her presentation, was it showed that um, personal information up until very recently, you know, the last few decades, has been dispersed. It's been available, and, and if you were um, a, a, a forensic detective, you may be able to put all those pieces together and get a composite view of a person. However, it was painstaking, and it required us taking different data sets and bringing them together to paint a picture. And under some of the changing regulation that we have in Europe, GDPR, open banking, PSD2, some of these um, uh, changes of regulations that give access to individuals, uh, one of the things that GDPR is saying is that PII is any information that relates to an identified person. And they can be any of these factors that you can see on screen right now, anything from our name to our social security number to maybe our mental state of mind or our genetic or ethnic background. But the problem that we have right now is that it's relatively simple to join all of those dots very, very easily, whether or not that's through the method that um, Masali or Ansgar have talked about, through our social footprint, through information that's available through the tax office, government searches, online, our ISP address. And so one of the key goals for us in a P7006 is to look at how we could train an AI agent that could actually move beyond asymmetry and start to harmonize personal data usage for human benefit. Because what we know at the moment is that the power to bring that information together is not necessarily used either for our benefit or for our um, uh, for an ideal personal outcome to any one human being. So the approach that we're taking with P7006 is to make sure that, first of all, it's ethics-based AI, um, that we are enabling, um, through the development of this standard, a means to influence and determine an individual's values and rules inputs just in the way that we do in the physical world, and that is that we shape our own personal decisions based on um, our culture, our education, our personal beliefs, our educational insights um, derived from traveling or our spiritual beliefs. And therefore, that we could develop um, uh, a framework so that an agent could negotiate individual rights that reflect an individual's um, value set. We also wanted to look at how we could start to mitigate against implications of data processing. So one of the things that already is in place under the General Data Protection Regulation for Europeans is that if an, a decision has been reached through an algorithm, the individual has the right of recourse to understand what those inputs were. And the other thing that we wanted to be able to do as life becomes much more complex is we wanted to be able to enable um, a personalized um, proxy representation for machine-to-machine -machine decisions, and that is, the ability to process complex information, like a contract or a legal set of terms and conditions, and surface for the individual um, either the insight or help them to understand what they're agreeing. And what this, what this informed for us early in the formation of our working group is that we were dealing with many complex systems, and what we needed to come up with, first of all, was the meta principles. Um, and those meta principles we've not set in stone. Um, we're revising them and reviewing them on an ongoing basis and circling back every six months. But I'll share a link to those meta principles at the end. But what we found while we were working through the meta principles that there was this theme of agency that connected the sum of the parts. This idea that as human beings, agency means our ability to independently make choices or to think and act in a way that shape our own life trajectory. And so what we wanted to do was look at how, from an ethical and an architecture point of view, we could start to design the inputs so that they could reflect a person's choices, their values, their ethics, 
their worldview, and therefore this agent could negotiate terms that correspond with their social norms. Now you might be thinking, oh, isn't that incredibly selfish? Or does that mean we're creating a different type of bias? And the, the challenge that we hold each other accountable to all the time is to say, well, in the physical world, if I prefer a temperature a certain, at a certain degree and you prefer it um, at a different, um, the ability for us to express that preference or request a climate or an environment that is conducive to where we are comfortable is something that we accept in the physical space. And so the challenge for us is not to enable something to be engineered so that um, it elevates the right of any one single individual over others, but instead, as this agent interacts with a machine-to-machine -machine decision, it is able to surface those preferences or it is able to shape things that reflect the worldview or the personal values of the individual. One of the things that we realize that we have to get right in the design of this is that currently there is the risk, and, and I think Ansgar did a fantastic job of covering this, of black box inputs where there is a complete lack of transparency to humans. And therefore, we realize that we need to be able to um, have a mechanism to train algorithms to develop this personalized AI. Um, and therefore, in order to be able to do that, it's essential that on a personal basis, we're able to access and correct subjective input. And a good example of that is when I think of my worldview 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even this morning, I had an interesting meeting earlier today and I can say on a particular subject, my worldview is quite different. And therefore, we need this, um, the ability for individuals not only to correct things that are visibly incorrect around the, a worldview or their experience, but also over the course of time to be able to shape that as we mature, as we learn, and as we have deeper life experiences. We also need to be able to um, connect this body of work to some of the other work that's happening on in other parts of IEEE around the access of personal data so that individuals will be able to have the rights to organize their data and in a machine readable format be able to, to have cons consent and permission to share that information so that it can either correct or express preferences or automate certain decisions without creating a significant cognitive load to the individual. Um, and the main reason we want to be able to do that is we also want this to be able to foresee and mitigate ethical implications of data processing. So for instance, the, the example that Asghar gave around insurance, if you aren't on a particular social network and you apply for a short insurance through a particular company, you would want that to be surfaced, that this company has a bias or it has a discount for people that are on a particular network. But if you aren't on that network, you would want to understand that before going in either to request a quote or to understand how you may um, have some disadvantage. Um, one of the last points that I would like to share with you is that out of the course of this work, what we've realized is that we are more and more becoming omnipresent. Um, you know, it, it started with our credit cards where we could set up payments even though we weren't physically present with our credit cards. Um, we could uh, have things processing real time on one part of the world while we might be traveling in another part of the world. And what we see that this is now extended actually to our individual identity and our personal intellectual property. And so what this, is, this body of work has started to challenge for us is to, to think of, well, what does this dual existence look like? If I have an AI agent or if I have an agent that is working on my behalf, does that change the way decisions are made for me in the physical world? Um, do I need to be present at the, uh, when those decisions are made or can some of these things be actually automated? Um, and as a result of that, I, I have to say that um, almost a year into this body of work, we have many more questions than we have answers, which have formed the subgroups that we've broken into. And these are the subgroups that exist right now. Um, we are open to creating more subgroups, but we are focusing on governance, the core principles, 
so that those principles can map to ethics and the architecture of how to design. Security, because obviously the security of data and identity is critical. Um, the methods of validation and verification, or if you like, access and authentication um, in machine-to-machine -machine decisions. And then we will not be making a decision, um, or, sorry, a, a um, recommendation on a type of technology, but we will be looking at the types of technologies that are available now that, that create greater um, security, protection, and control for the individual. Uh, uh, as introdu introduced, I am the chair. The vice chair is Gree Hasselbutt. The secretary is Ken Wallace. Um, and the staff liaison is Christy Barn. In the, um, in the slide here, we also have a link to the current um, principles. Uh, and I'm sorry that I missed the beginning of this. This work would not have come about um, if it wasn't for the inspiration from the work that we were doing with John um, earlier on the ethical design. And that it became apparent as we worked through that that there was a need for us to address this asymmetry by being able to design something that worked um, specifically to represent a single human being. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the excellent presentation and um, great information. And that, as I said before, to all of you, that applies to everybody. Um, um, Ansgar, Bali, all. And uh, John pinch hitting for a, a couple minutes, and so um, uh, we did get some some very um, uh, good questions come through the chat. Um, however, we are past the top of the hour, so what we'll do is we'll take the questions and send them to the panelists, and then they will be posted at a later date and, uh, online, and the link will be sent to all of you who registered for for today. And also in that email, there will also be a link to the slide deck as well as the recording of this of this webinar. And uh, all of the chairs um, and speakers have put links to how to get in touch. Um, they are in the slide deck, but we will also consolidate that and provide that in the email as well. And so um, I want to thank all of the again all, all of the speakers um, who joined today and. And just as much, I want to thank all the participants who took time to join us today. And um, hope this was a very beneficial um, hour for all of you and that you want to get interested in participating. So, um, so thank you all. We are past the hour. So thank you for joining. And have a wonderful day, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you may.